Is it working? It says we're live. Got 21 participants. That's pretty good. So I got to try and keep my eyes on the camera, although the chat is right behind the camera, so I might be looking that way more than I should be. How are you guys doing? We got, it says we have 21 people on here. That ain't too bad, considering I posted it on the two days ago. Let's see here. Uh, stream. Can, how's the uh, audio and the video quality coming through? Can you let me know in the chat. Good? Good? Okay, cool. Cool. Thank you. And I have it on... Uh, I got a lot of people coming in. Wow, 50 people already now. That's really good. So uh, kind of a lot of a few topics. Of course, I got a lot of questions about engines, but if I try to answer engine questions on here, it's going to... I'll end up talking a lot about one little thing, and we only have an hour here. Um, so the first one would be, uh, I'm going to kind of... I want some feedback from you guys. Hey, Harry and Peter and Cheeseburger Randy and Charles. My gosh, we got a lot of people coming on. Um, do you like this background in the videos more when I do the ones where I'm just sitting down? Or do you like the white, the like white screen background? Hey, Chad's on here. He comments in almost every video. Yep. Paul, Rich, Shane. Wow. The current one. So you do like this background? Okay. It's not too cluttered with like the engine stuff and the, I don't know. Sometimes you can see the reflection with the the play button. So gray is a better background. The walls and the shelves. Hey, Josh, that's the one in the front. Fine. Okay, cool. All right, cool. And then the, uh, what hat would you like me to wear in this stream? I'm wearing the Western States one. It's kind of cool because it has their territory on the side. And of course, they're my employee, but you can also do the yellow stitch hat. I've got the old C block one, or it doesn't matter. I've got a variety of hats here. I could even wear this one. It is a cat hat, but it's a little, it's almost 95. So we're going to do that. Uh, do I work for Holt Cat? No, I do not work for Western States, which this is their territory. Uh, Idaho is most of their territory. And then they have uh, parts of Montana, Wyoming, um, Washington, and Oregon. But like I said, Idaho is most of their territory. When's the merch dropping? Uh, what merch would you like? I don't really make any clothes. I don't... I guess I should, I should probably get a... Um, I had a buddy do a really ro low resolution um, kind of a graphic for the channel. It was like a, uh, an ape skull with wrenches going through it, but it was low resolution. I actually have been playing with, and probably people on here before, hey, from El Salvador, my, uh, my, never mind. I don't want to get into personal stuff, but uh, hello from El Salvador. So, um, Anyway, he made a little um, graphic for the channel, but it was low resolution, and then he was going to make a high resolution one, and he never got to it. And this was someone from my old dealership. I still talk to him occasionally. Um, and I've been playing with, has anyone messed with the AI graphic image making? It's pretty cool. There's free ones. Um, I've been messing with one called Crayon, where you can tell a computer in artificial intelligence, hey, make a, a gorilla that with wrenches or something. And it'll actually make one. It's pretty cool. Um, but the images are very low quality and you get really weird stuff back from these AIs. Like it's related to what you said and it's not pulling images from the internet. It's making them, but uh, nothing really that was perfect. It's something I might mess with for a while. So what do we got? Uh, Dominican Republic. Cool. Uh, Jared from, you know, I'm guessing that's North Carolina. You're a cool mechanic, a technician if you choose. Great videos. Thank you. Uh, I was working on a video today. What do you think the future cat-related electric vehicles coming out? Uh, I don't know. I um, mean, electric with... 
So electric vehicles, and I'm assuming you're referring to, was it just trucks? Let's see here. I'm answering uh, Harry Harriet's question. What do you think the future with CAD is related to electric vehicles? So I'm assuming by vehicles, you, you mean equipment or if they're going to be making um, on highway trucks electric. I know Cummins is working on it. And then you have companies, obviously, Tesla's making a electric truck. Haven't seen it on the road yet, though. And then there's that company Nikolai, which obviously Nikolai Tesla, uh, it's kind of a rip off off that name. And they were using hydrogen, not electric, I believe. But I think that turned out to be a scam. Um, I watched their like live stream unveiling for the Nikolai truck because I actually find electric vehicles very interesting. But um, the trucking market, that's going to be real tricky because Trucks are inverse to vehicles, right? Vehicles are generally very low loaded, meaning, you know, the engine's less than 20% of its capacity as far as horsepower and torque output. And they're usually in town driving, whereas a truck is generally very high percentage of its engine output, and it's usually long distance. So I, I think that'll be a really tough market. I think if electric trucks or vehicles, um, not talking about cars, were to be useful, I think it would have to be mostly, unless battery technology changes drastically, it would have to be something like garbage trucks because um, they're local and they do a lot of stop and go and they're not always 100% loaded. I, I think it'll be a while if electric ever works out in trucking. Um, and then equipment's even worse because it's generally on remote sites. How are you going to recharge the equipment? It's extremely heavy. I, I, I don't see that working out really well um they're doing some cool stuff with electric trucks yeah i think i like i said elect electric vehicles i ride mostly i've been riding my electric bike to work so um obviously electric and bikes work really well together because they're light and they're easy to charge and stuff uh, the truck's a little more difficult let's see uh brett dale could a stuck iva solenoid cause a low current code uh are you getting an iva I'm assuming you mean the individual solenoids? No. So the solenoid portion, because the how the IVAs work are they're electric over mechanical to control a hydraulic, right? They're controlling engine oil to change the timing of the intake valve. So if the solenoid sticks or the plunger sticks, right? The solenoid is a magnet. It's just a coil that moves a mechanical thing, the plunger, which controls the oil that keeps the intake valve open longer. If the plunger sticks, the solenoid will not know that. So, oh, it says the connection is unstable. That's unfortunate. I don't know why it's doing that. Are we still getting, is the connection okay? I'm still getting chat. Okay, okay, good. Okay, good. So if the plunger is stuck, it's not gonna affect the electrical side of the solenoid. So if, if you're getting a low current fault, a low current fault is an open circuit. And that means you most likely have a wiring problem or the solenoid itself needs replaced. So there you go. Okay, I'm glad it's coming back. All right, so let's see what other questions we got here. Would you recommend upcoming technicians to enter your field of work? Uh, that's a question from Harry Harriet. Well, my field of work is, yes, uh, most trucks, most cat dealer, not most, most cat dealers have a truck shop or truck shop locations. Of course, cat has not made a truck engine now for over a decade. Um, unless you count the cat truck, which I don't. So would it be a good idea to, as a 20 year old, try to mimic me and be a cat truck engine specialist? And no, that would probably not be a good idea. It has worked out well for me just due to the timing I entered the career. Um, you know, cat was still making truck engines and there's still a lot of them on the road, but of course that is a diminishing market. Now, an engine is an engine. I could, I'm sure, rebuild a Cummins. I've worked on several of them. I've never rebuilt one, though, just due to me knowing engines in general. But a Cummins expert is going to be more knowledgeable than me. So if, if you specifically want to work on truck engines, 
Um, you could work at a cat dealer and get experience and you'll probably be working on Cummins more and more, but it's probably better to work at like a Freightliner or uh, a Peterbilt. If you only want to work on truck engines and you want to be very good at them. If you just want to work on general trucks, of course, many cat dealers have truck dealerships and I really enjoy working on them. And I, I love cat engines more than anything else um, as far as engine wise. So it would not be a great idea to try to mim mimic me exactly. But then again, Cat still makes lots of engines for their equipment, and I still work on their engines. And almost all the truck engines they used to make are still in equipment. C13s, C15s, um, C7s not so much anymore. They have like the 71 Perkins, which are not my favorite. But um, but Cat Cat is a great place to work, though. A lot of people that work for Cat don't work anywhere else. So I don't want to say, hey, go to a Peterbilt dealer. You'll be happier. I would say if you can get a job with Cat, you'll probably be very happy. Okay. We got another VBA question. I'm not going to touch that one. Do they still run the C15 and new equipment? Uh, yes, they do. They have C18s too. Um, I did a video not too long ago on a haul truck with a C18 in it. C18 built out on NXSMSX. Uh, you could build a, I'm assuming you mean MXS or an assert engine, the, the compound turbo ones. You could build one of those to be a C18 if you wanted. You'd need a different crankshaft and the, C C, the C18 liners. Um, but they're already 15.2 inch bore or 15.2 inch um, displacement engines. And with the compound turbos, you can make one into a C18, but... They they can already make over 600 horsepower stock, so you don't you wouldn't need to do that. <clears throat> Thoughts on putting a cat engine in a pickup truck? Uh, that would be pretty cool. Uh, I heard of a guy when I was at a uh, Cashman Mold dealer that had a 3306 in his pickup. I think it was an F350. That's a pretty big engine. I believe that's a 10 liter. I don't know what kind of transmission he would have, um, but that. That would maybe be the way to go. If I was going to do one, um, I would probably get, I think the coolest thing to do would be get, I like the older, like 67, I mean, yeah, it was 67 to 79 Fords, the really wide ones I had. I've had two of those. I don't have one now, but um, I'd probably put a 3126 in it um, or a C9. C9 might be good, but there are the asserts of the injectors seem to have a little more problems. I really like the round top 3126s. I'd probably put one of those in a truck. Um, they're very, very simple engines to work on, and they seem to have less Huey pump problems. And you can make over 300 horsepower and over 800 foot-pounds of torque with them. Uh, let's see here. What does Adept Ape mean? Oh, that's a, I get that question a lot, actually. So where does, my where does the title of my channel come from? Uh, well, when I started the channel, I mean, we're talking almost eight years ago now, I had no idea why, um, what the purpose of my channel was going to be on. I didn't know if I'd make videos on bicycles or cooking or politics or whatever. I'm so glad I didn't do politics. Um, but, uh, I wanted something that was kind of short, kind of that rhymed, um, and I was actually trying to get my brother, who is way more creative than me, to start a YouTube channel, but he he didn't want to. I think he's nervous with talking. I'm obviously not nervous with talking. I talk all the time. Can't shut up. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe it should be like beginning letters of the alphabet. So um, this might make me sound like a nerd, but there's a, a, like a board game and a video game called Warhammer 40K. And there's some called the Adeptus Mechanicus, which Mechanicus, well, what is this? Uh, what is this crap? All right, we got some spam. So we're going to hide user. Anyway. Um, yeah, I, why do they do? Why do people try to ruin streams? And anyway, so that's where I kind of, I took that name and I shortened it. And then I just, um, that's where the name come from. Would I, I would not pick it again uh, if I had to. My, my daughter actually said I should call it uh, Big Iron, which that would have been a great name. But like I said, I didn't think I'd be making mechanic videos when I started, so I didn't want to make it specific. And so if you ever watched the early videos on my channel, I have like one on shaving, one on bicycles. Um, there's a bunch. Actually, some of those videos have done well. But so that random 
dip tape. That's just, that's what's stuck. And, uh, you know, you probably can't read it because it's white lettering, but that's what it is now. So there you go. What's your thoughts on Toyota's patent this spring on a new injector that may eliminate uh, DPF and DEF? It's a fuel injector. Is this on a diesel engine? Uh, I'm answering Ramosal's question. I don't know. Does uh, someone international head cat? Yes, diesel. Okay, so it is a diesel. I don't know how a even more efficient running engine or a, a different style injector would eliminate, especially the def portion. If it was so efficient that it burned all of the carbon in the combustion process, you wouldn't need a DPF. If you don't have any carbon or soot, soot is carbon, of course, unburned fuel molecules, you don't need a DPF because you're not catching excess soot. It would have to burn super efficient, though. I I don't think just the injector itself would be able to do that. They they would have to have really high cylinder pressures, extra oxygen. I don't I don't know what else how you would get away from making no exhaust. Um, and basically, you cannot have any soot coming out of the exhaust pipe. So I, I'd be I'd be interested to see uh, how that would work. Def on the other def I don't I would love to have it go away. And they can get rid of most. So what's def trying to eliminate is NOx and OX. Um, nitrous oxides, not NOS, which I called it in one of the earlier videos. But anyway, um, that is created from just having air, which is mostly nitrogen and oxygen under high heat and high pressure. So there's no way to eliminate that in the cylinder. You have to get rid of it. Um, the best way is to reduce the amount of oxygen, which is what EGR does. And then DEF just gets rid of a little bit at the end. So really, I, I wish they'd pick either EGR or DEF instead of having both. Um, I would probably go with EGR because DEF is so problem prone. It's insane. Um, but that would be awesome if they get rid of both of those systems with just an injector design change, which I'm very skeptical of. That would be pretty cool. Uh, 3406E, oil max temp and coolant temp. I that's something you could look up, but generally coolant temp, uh, high coolant temp is going to be around 225 degree Fahrenheit and max oil temps, oil temps usually run slightly higher than coolant temps. So generally you want to keep that under 250 degrees Fahrenheit oil temperature. How do you know if you can reflash an ECM to a higher horsepower? Do you just look to see if the transmission can handle it? So a re-rate, uh, that's called a re-rate in the cat world. Um, so to get a higher horsepower out of your diesel engine, your cat diesel we're talking about, electronic ones here also, which I'm very familiar with. I don't know how you actually re-rate the older ones, if you could, like a B model. Uh, I don't know if John Goldsmith's on here, but he would know the answer to that. Anyway, um, so there's many steps to do to do a re-rate, uh, and I get questions on it all the time. So yes, first thing you have to do is always see what the transmission is rated at, and if it's an Eaton, it's very easy. You just look at the model number. It'll be like an RTLO, and then the first two numbers after that are usually a 16 or an 18, and that tells you the torque. So it's rated for 1,800 torque or 1,600 torque. And a re-rate generally will change the horsepower and the torque. Sometimes, though, it can just change the torque or just the horsepower. So your max torque, if it's going to change, has to obviously be less than the rating of the transmission. So if that matches, then no. You still have to do a lot of verifying to see what the current rating is in the engine ECM. And then CAT has a whole bunch of charts. And the charts will tell you if it needs different injectors, different turbochargers, if it's in a different family, it can't be re-rated. And then it'll give you a bunch of options. And then you can go into something called the feature protection system. Of course, most people on here can't do that. A dealer tech has to do it. And most dealer techs by themselves don't know how to do it either. You have to find someone that's very knowledgeable on this. Um, luckily, I've done lots of them, so I am knowledgeable on that. But it, it takes a long time to do, like, look up a proper re-rate. Usually, it's about 15 to 20 minutes of my time to look up a re-rate. So, not super easy. Uh, let's see here. If you ever watched his channel at all, you know he's not bald. Oh, no, I'm not bald. I'm, I don't have a bald spot, luckily. 
Um, you might think of balding because I have a high, what do they call it, a widow peak, but I've literally had the same hairline since I was a kid. So, yeah, I think a lot of people think I wear the hats because I'm bald. I'm luckily not bald. In fact, we're going to change hats here. We're going to go with a... We're going to go with this, like, cowboy... Cowboy one. Uh, okay. Let's see here. We got, uh, he needs a mustache. I've had several different facial hairs over the years. Um, micro beard this year. Who knows? We'll see. Maybe I'll grow my, uh, I started growing a cool. Well, I thought it was cool. Mustache. Um, and I've had a handlebar mustache before, before I started the channel and I've had the goatees and what other crazy nonsense. But, um, my wife did not want me to have a mustache. So Clean shaven. Might get the beard back, though. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, what should I check if I get an engine oil overheat but no coolant overheat? Well, generally, your So the ECM does not monitor your en engine oil temperature. If you're getting a high engine oil temperature, you might have a problem with the sensor. A lot of the times, the sensor is in the oil pan. If you do have an oil temp sensor... And those sensors, the wiring's usually right next to the ground. It's covered in oil and grease, and it gets unplugged all the time. The sensors are very inaccurate. I'd say the first thing to do is verify that the sensor and the gauge are reading accurately. And it'd be very weird if you were getting high oil temperature, but not high coolant temperature, because your oil cooler is cooling the oil, and it should be consistent with the coolant temperature to some extent. Um, maybe you have a very plugged oil cooler if it is actually reading accurately. Have you ever gotten to work on a 1693? Oh, that's a cool question. So no, um, I would very much like to, I've heard a lot of stories about how advanced they were. I'd like to make a video on it, but I've never, I'm not familiar with them. Um, apparently they were overhead cam engines and they were advanced for their time. Um, but they're something like 40 years old now, but I've, I've heard they're very cool engines. Uh, what is your, oh, that's a political question. No political question. Let's see. Hi, my name is Blake. Uh, this is classic trucks and bikes. Hi, my name is Blake. I'm in UTI right now taking their course, uh, course for diesel program going to the Freightliner class very soon. But as a starting out tech, what would be the common tools to have starting? Uh, well, if you're going to UTI, I don't know if they supply you with the box. Um, but you're going to need as a, as a tech, you need thousands of dollars in tools. If they are going to supply you with a box, just start with that and then go from there. If they're not going to supply you with a box, best thing you can do is save some money or maybe get your parents or grandparents or whatever to get go on eBay or go on, um, something, a Craigslist marketplace, whatever. Try to find a used toolbox, like a snap-on box, that already has tools in it. A lot of guys are always getting out of the industry or they're changing jobs. Hold on. Like, dogs are going nuts. Okay. Okay. Buy a used toolbox. Um, generally, that's what I tell younger people. And get it used. Well, that's what a used toolbox is. But get a used toolbox. With tools already, you will save tens of thousands of dollars. Um, also, don't buy a lot of air tools. I have tons of air tools. And now, like, almost everyone, at least in my shop, uses Milwaukee. Everything. Um, don't, buy, don't buy really any air tools. And if you are in school and there's stuff you need, usually the school is going to have a discount program um, where you can get tools at cost up to a certain dollar limit. Try to use that in the grace period that you have to use that because let's say you want to snap on torque wrench that's like with a torque angle that are like $600, $700. You can get it for maybe $400 as long as you're in that program. So try to save your money and buy tools initially because you don't want to be paying full price on the truck. Okay. Uh, I don't care about no Cummins. <laughs> I don't know much... I know how Cummins work, but I'm not a Cummins guy at all. Any advice for guys just graduating diesel tech school that aren't sure where they want to go? Uh, this is Ryan Stewart's question. I guess, do you mean like go in the country, like where you want to live or what field you want to be in? 
because that that's a big difference. Um, I can't say, you know, obviously, I mean, I know I like it here, um, but maybe you hate the cold or hate bugs. So you don't want to live in Florida or whatever. Um, I guess that that's an easier question you have to ask yourself. But what field you don't know what field you want to be in until you work on them. You might think, oh, I want to work on equipment and you work on equipment. And you hate it. Or you might think, oh, I want to be like Josh and work on truck engines and you hate trucks and you hate truck engines. You never want to pull an oil pan again. I'd say the best thing to do would be you have to get in the field. Just get the first decent job that comes up and maybe you hate it. Maybe the company sucks. Then leave. Don't stay in a dead end company. Um, staying in a dead end company makes your job miserable. If you hate your job, you need to leave. Also, if the company sucks as far as pay and benefits, you need to punish them by leaving that company. That is an incentive for them to turn and get better wages, better benefits. Because when people stay in crappy jobs, they hate that are underpaid. It is worse for everyone. So, okay. Uh, just finished someone. I think he's asked this question 50 times. Just finished a platinum overhaul. With Foley, $45,000. Engine is pushing oil out of the blow-by tube. Is this normal after overhaul? Uh, I'm going to butcher his name. It's Radames? Radames? Uh, Punts? Um, so, it's pushing oil out of the blow-by tube. So, all engines have blow-by, right? It's, they have gaps on the end, of, or, well, the piston rings have gaps on them. Hold on. Piston ring. Okay, so there's a gap on the end of the piston ring, right? It's in the cylinder. And after the rebuild, of course, the rings are close to closed. Um, you get a little bit of blow-by gases past the rings, even on a new engine. There's specifications generally for how much, though. So if it's dripping out of there, <sighs> dripping out doesn't tell you the volume. You have to know the volume. Cat doesn't have like a pressure number. They have a volume number. So you need to know... Okay, this engine's, let's say, a 500 horsepower engine. Generally, the rule of thumb is under full load, so that's max boost, 100% throttle at 1,800 RPM. You want to be less than twice your horsepower. So if it's a 500 horsepower engine, you'd want less than 1,000 cubic feet per minute of, or is it cubic feet per hour? I forget the setting. But anyway, cubic feet out of the engine um, measured under full load. If you just paid $45,000 and you're getting more than that, something's wrong. It could be the rings haven't seated yet. Maybe a ring is broken. Maybe you've got bad valve guides or valve seals or a turbocharger. Turbochargers can cause this too. Air compressors can cause this. There can be many causes of blow-by. Uh, when oil is dripping out of the blow-by tube, that's called carryover. Carryover... That's not always, that doesn't always mean that there's too much blow by. It could be that the wire mesh inside has failed, the oil level is slightly too high. There can be many causes of that. But if it is concerning and it looks like a lot of blow by, you need to get a volume measurement done. Let's see here. Uh, I just want to see how oh, this is John. Uh, let's see here. Just want to say thanks. Oh, thank you, John. Watching your channel save my vacation when I couldn't get my C7 started. Yeah, that's got to be frustrating. Ended up being the water separator was emptied and started for diesel prime and started. That's cool. Have you ever watched any Channel One videos? Yes, uh, I've seen a few at work. I mean, cats. I almost have as many subscribers as Caterpillar does on YouTube. And if you watch the cat videos, they're well produced but they put out like multiple videos a day and they're very short and they're very specific and they get like 60 views so i don't know what their strategy is obviously mine's to get lots of views and be entertaining I, theirs don't even seem educational so i'm not then we're talking about caterpillar here not western states um so i don't i don't know um but yes i have seen channel one a couple of their videos on uh, at work i i don't I don't really like, well, I don't want to say I don't like equipment. I don't work on equipment much, and most of their stuff is directed at equipment. But I don't know, and it, mo many of the guys have learned much from the Channel 1 videos. Oh, ever seen Shake Hands with Danger? Uh, Danny McPherson. Yes, I've seen it 
twice. So at our old dealership, I probably saw it 12 years ago. And that's funny you asked that because our last safety meeting, which was the end of August, it was like a 20 something. They actually played the first half of Shake Hands with Danger. If anyone doesn't know what Shake Hands with Danger is, it's a uh, it's a safety, it's a very tongue-in-cheek safety training video that Cat produced um, a few years ago. And a few years ago, it was like 1980. Um, it's very 70s-esque and it's somewhat graphic too, but uh it it's it's pretty funny. So okay. Can a 2WS block replace a 6NZ block? Uh, I, I hate these questions where it's like, will this engine fit this engine? Because I, I mean, I believe it would. Um, they're both 14.6 bore or 14.6 displacement. Um but I don't, you know, I work at a dealer. We don't mix and match that much. So, you know, I don't usually get like a 5EK and then have to turn it into a C18 or stuff like that. Um, but I believe the differences mostly from the 2WS to a 6NZ are mostly the front structure because the, the timing sensors are different. The oil pan might be different, though, on a 2WS. I don't I don't think that one needs a spacer plate. I know the 6 and Z does not have a spacer plate. They have a ladder plate. So our red keeps sending the pictures of a bunch of goats. I'm, ass I'm assuming that is greatest of all time. That's what the goat means. I'm assuming. Uh, any book recommendations on C15 or C13 engines? No. I don't, I don't know what book you would read about a C-15 engine. I don't know if one's ever been written by a C-15. They mostly just power trucks. They don't write books. On a C-15 assert, does the spacer plate between the head need to be changed after pulling the head? It does not need to be changed. No, you can reuse them technically. Um, they're difficult to clean properly, though. Probably if you're going to reuse it, uh, don't wire wheel it. Don't buff it. Uh, you want to use a sandblaster. The ones, if we ever reuse them, uh, we pretty much always replace them now, even though they're fairly expensive. Um, generally, you wire wheel, or don't wire wheel them. Do not wire wheel them. You generally media blast them like a sandblaster, so you're not really removing material. And then I would definitely straight edge it. Because um, if, if you remove much material, that can mess with your liner heights or cause a leak there. Those are very leak prone areas already. But they can be reused technically, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, it's Justin, Justin Jose. Howdy, can you talk about cat stresses, good housekeeping, and being clean at all times? P.S. Is there a cat guide to that? Uh, yes. So there's cat contamination control guidelines, and they actually rate dealerships based on how clean each dealer is, but also each location. And certain dealers strive for levels. And the levels are very expensive because to be a very high level of contamination control, you have to have climate controlled buildings. You can't have dirty trucks or equipment coming in, which especially equipment is very difficult to get in and out. I mean, our, our shop here is much dirtier than the one that I worked at in Nevada. Uh, Nevada, it was a positive pressure building and it was paved all the way around and we only did trucks and generators in our shop. So not much dirt. And since it was positive pressure, you don't have dirt blowing in. The one here, we only have heaters, um, which obviously that's for winter, but in the summer, it's pretty hot. It was in the nineties today. Um, so all the doors are open and it's almost always windy here and there's, it, it's not paved around. So we get dust. There's a ton of dirt. There's a, there's always a layer of dirt in the shop, which irritates me, but the, it would cost the company so much money. They would have to put AC units or some sort of positive pressure unit in, pave the entire area, which would be nice, but it, it's a ton of money. Um, but I don't know of a, there probably is a guidelines book that Cat has, but I've, I've never read it. That would be a pretty dry read, I think. Okay, let's see here. Or just say, what's the most expensive repair job you've ever done on a cat engine? Most, hmm. 
most expensive repair job you've ever done on a cat engine. So at Cashman, the other dealership, I, when I was, so I did generators before going into the truck side, I worked on the 3,500 series engines. Now, if you've never seen those before, I do have a video on them. They're humongous. They are up to 3,000 horsepower. And I've seen them have major catastrophic failures. Uh, there was a 346, I believe it was a B? Not 346, a 33, what am I talking about? 3516. It's a 16 cylinder 3500 series engine. And it was mechanical. And the rack, they have racks like a 3116 in them, had locked full fuel and it had oversped. And it knocked pretty much all the injectors and dropped all the valves. Um, that was at one of the casinos in Nevada. That's probably the most damage I've ever seen. And that was probably $150,000. And this would have been 15 years ago. So I don't know what that would translate today. I don't know what the parts cost on, but let's probably double that. Um, so it's probably $250,000, $300,000 repair. That was probably the biggest one I ever saw, like damage and then repair wise. Uh, let's see here. R asks, what are your thoughts on technology advances in the heavy duty trade? Now getting more pulse width modulation and all the nodes connection to all the ECM. Is our trade dying? No. Um, look at this. John Goldsmith's here. Uh, TWS 40 uh, bolt oil pan, 6 NZ's 24 bolt pan, front pan gasket set up. Not the same. Say he would know. Um, let's see here. Hello, John, by the way. Uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, so let's get back to the pulse width modulation. So pulse width modulation is not new. Uh, even the cat truck engines, their throttle pedals are pulse width modulation. That's a fairly simple electrical principle. Um, and then the nodes, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by nodes. That's not really, I think that's more of an automotive term. If you're just talking about the different modules that communicate over the data link, it's very complicated, but it's still electricity and computers. Um, I find the data links interesting. Um, I find in ECMs interesting. They complicate things more. They don't complicate things by themselves. It's more of having the software to communicate with them. And us being a cat dealer, trying to get software to communicate with Cummins and Ford and Freightliner and Detroit. Um, cats, obviously we don't have any problems with that is a real pain in the butt. Um, that's kind of why I made that, um, the open source software discussion and the right to repair. Cause it, it's really frustrating as a mechanic when you can't get the software you need because, Oh, you're not a dealer for this, or you gotta pay $1,200 for this. That's my nerves. Uh, okay. Ever heard term witness lap uh is that like a witness mark john i'm not i i don't know are you talking about like the machining marks across like uh on the top of the deck of a block not sure okay uh ricky says your video on injector diagnosis helped me pinpoint injector failure on a 3126 causing a rough running engine Coming from a Chevy dealer, I'm not familiar with the Huey system. Oh, cool. I helped a lot. Uh, piston ring. Oh, okay. So you're talking about, I think you're talking about on the, hold on. Okay. So are you talking about the wear line in the piston ring itself? I believe that's what you're referring to. I have heard of that. Um, not generally something I look at though. I, I understand that the, what is it? The larger the witness line. So what John Goldsmith in the chat he is talking about here is generally piston rings will get this line in them. And I, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But anyway, they'll get wear lines on them. You can kind of see it here. And depending on how wide or narrow that is, this can kind of tell you how worn the piston ring is. Um, yes, I have heard of those. It's, I'm not an expert on it. And I don't generally look at it. I've only seen them in classes. And I've, I've seen them like this. But um I've never pulled pistons out and measured them or anything to that extent. So, okay. What do you think about right to repair machines? Uh, let's see. I try not to get political here, but I, I think it would be a good idea if 
machines, software in general was not locked down by the manufacturer so that you had to purposely buy their stuff. It's kind of like when they made OBD2, not open source, but basically they standardized it. It'd be nice if the organization known as the government that is supposed to standardize stuff um, could possibly get the industry to standardize like, hey, let's use one program for diesel engines instead of you having 500 different programs. Um, and I believe also manufacturers should give you the wiring diagrams and the repair information. I think it would, I don't think they ever would by themselves because it would probably give them a competitive disadvantage, but if they were all made to do it, um, I think it would help everyone in general. Then there's no competitive disadvantage and everyone that owns the equipment would be better off. Will that ever happen? I don't think so, but that's kind of my current standings on it. But like my political views and that type of stuff is somewhat fluid all the time. Um, but that's kind of my stance on it. Uh, Steve says, you must have a good relationship with your employer to film. How do they feel about you spending time to film? Any rules? I've seen blurred out FedEx truck recently. Okay, so I hope someone would ask this question. So when I worked at my old dealership, Cashman, my direct supervisor knew about my channel. And of course, my channel is smaller then. But I didn't, I don't think like the owner knew and stuff like that. Um, so... There, it was kind of a laissez-faire attitude, like, yeah, just, you know, don't get us in trouble. No one really ever talked to me about it. Um, but also our building was separate. But here, when I started, I told them when I hired on. Um, and there was never really a problem. And I tried to be secretive when I was filming and stuff. And then around Christmas of last year, I guess the owner found out, the owner of uh, Western States. And he was, from what I heard... Um, was wondering why he was a mechanic filming what he's doing and not working type situation. Um, and then I was told like, oh, you know, let's kind of keep it hush hush for a little bit. Well, almost immediately after that, like two or three weeks after that, um, the head of marketing came to me and said, you know what? Uh, we fully back you. Um, you can basically film whatever you like, as long as, you know, you're professional and you're not you know, doing anything derogatory to the company, anything like that. And um, he's really good. Like the marketing team here at Western States is really good. Um, and ever since that meeting, which was in January, I've basically said, don't worry about trying to hide it. You're filming. Just do your job and film. Um, like I've met the CEO of Western States. Um, people like the videos. We kind of incorporate the videos and Western States together, they repost them and stuff like that. And uh, so far it has blossomed. It's, it's done really well. And the reason I'm even doing this live stream, I'm not going to tell you why, but I'm just saying I'm kind of testing it out for something that's going to be coming up in the future. So of course, if you're a subscriber, you're probably already going to watch it, but uh, it could be interesting. Uh, Larry Bird, how do you get the name of Depth Tape? You missed that. I already explained that one. So Yes, my employers don't mind me filming. And I actually bring work into the shop that way. I've had people come from Texas, Florida, Montana, Washington, like lots of places for rebuilds. And like I'm working on a serpentine belt swap right now that I'm filming uh, for a guy on a C16. And he brought it to me because I'm me, because he watches the channel. So that's, I don't know what the job's going to cost, $10,000 or five thousand dollars or so i'm not sure what the final bill is going to be i wouldn't say if i knew it anyway but that's work that we wouldn't have got if it wasn't for me filming i'm still very efficient i'm like 90 percent efficient um on our ratings which you have to be a minimum of 80 so not a problem let's see do you clean dpfs out or just replace um if it's just dirty clean them out they're very expensive if they're cracked or broken obviously you need to replace them let's see do you work at the Meridian location? That's top secret. I cannot tell you these things. Um, if you ever want me to work on your truck, though, just email me. Uh, we can, you will find out where I work, but I'm not going to say it on the channel. Uh, how is efficiency measured as a mechanic? So uh, that's a good question. They take your numbers. So they track your time. So as a mechanic, 
like your paperwork is two things generally. It's service reports, which is what you did during the day, and then your time. So your time entry is always big because you're hourly and the shop bills hourly, right? So you're billing at, I believe our shop rate's 160, and you're billing that time. That's how you make the company money, and that's how you make money in return. So they take how much of your time, your eight-hour day, although today I worked over 10 hours, but um, that time compared to how much of it is billed out. So, of course, you you can't, unless you're flat rate, be over 100% because you're going to have meetings, vacation time, um, jobs aren't going to go well. Um, you're going to go over sometimes, stuff like that, cleaning, like these are not billed hours. So they take how much of your time they're paying you, and then they take how much of your time got billed to customers, and it's basically just a division equation. That's how you get your percentage. Uh, John Goldsmith, do you like soft or hard vehicle speed limit or cruise? Um, well, I don't drive, John, so I don't. Uh, I always set it to whatever it is if the customer wants to change, but that's not really a question I get very often. Uh, will Western states rebuild a B model pump? I'm not sure where the closest um, pump rebuild shop is. I don't know one at Western States, but I've only been here two years. I know our shop does not. I would not rebuild a pump here anyways. It's it's not clean enough. Um, I don't know if we have a, a pump rebuild shop here. That's kind of a... I wish I knew that there was because there's still a lot of those B models running around. But also, if it's a pump shop, usually they can do 3306s and 3406s. Let's see here. I went to Las Vegas when you were there to troubleshoot my water temperature, sensor my motorhome, 100% fix. Oh, cool. I try to fix stuff. It's like my job. Oh, boy. How much is an overhaul for a C15 bridge engine? So, um, so if you don't know what a bridge engine is, it's an MBN serial number. That is between the 6NZ and then the BXS serial number. So it's a single turbo but electronically actuated wastegate. C15, C-15. Uh, rebuild costs, it's hard to say. So generally a platinum kit is going to run you, which a platinum kit is a cylinder head, cylinder packs, injectors, water pump, oil pump, and seals. That is, and I don't know what promos there are now. Cat was given like $1,500 off or $1,200 off or $1,215 to $2,500 off. I don't know what promos are going on right now though. Um, the kits were running about $12,000. To fourteen thousand dollars last year. I, I'm not sure what they are now. The problem is they're hard to get the kits. If you can get them, that's the base kit. So generally, you don't end up doing just the kit. Usually, if you're doing a rebuild on C15, you're going to cut counterbores. Now, counterbore all that increases parts wise are the liner shims, which are about eighty dollars each, and there's six of those. And then you add on generally spacer plate. Um, so let's say another eight hundred dollars in parts there, bare minimum. So let's say you're at $13,000 parts. Then you have labor. Labor depends on what you're doing. Um, but if you're cutting counter bores, a rebuild's probably 50 to 60 hours on a platinum kit to do it correctly. But usually you end up adding stuff like the oil cooler, the turbocharger, um, internal harnesses. Uh, you might end up doing the valve cover base, um, helicoils for the valve covers. You might do the air compressor. You might do the external harness. Like it just, it adds up very quickly. So generally you're talking base $20,000 for a rebuild and up from there. Generally they end up being closer to 30 because people usually end up adding the oil cooler, the turbocharger and, you know, stuff like that. And then you might run into problems with the cam. If the, if the cam's bad, you might want to do a long block because the cam shaft, you're going to buy the cams rocker and it's going to be way past 30 generally. Okay, that answer that. Do you guys flat rate jobs for customers or bill by clock hours? Um, we try to quote everything. Um, we try to quote everything initially. Of course, quotes don't always entail stuff that you don't, you know, that you find. So if, let's say you quote it, let's say it's an RV and you're doing a Huey pump, right? Um, depending on the access, maybe it's six hours or something. Um, we'll quote it unless something extra comes up. Like even if you go over on your time, let's say you have seven hours in it, they'll generally hold to their quote. So it, I would say Western States is pretty honest. And Catherine was also, 
um, to holding with their quotes unless something comes up, you know, the coolant line breaks over the Huey pump, you end up having to drain the coolant, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, we we'll usually, it'll usually match the quote. If it's under, I think sometimes they will bill up, but I don't, I don't do the billing side. So I don't, I don't end up knowing, I only know how much time I put on it. I don't know if they fly rate it up, but I would think usually it'll hold to the quote. Okay. What do you prefer, mechanical or electronic heavy equipment when it comes to durability and efficiency? Well, I, I'm not an equipment guy, but on the engines, I prefer electronic. And that's because I have the cat dealer software and it makes troubleshooting the engine easier. You know, if you have an engine miss on a B model, you're cracking fuel lines, you're looking at stuff. If it's on a 346E, you can do a cylinder cutout test to know which cylinder it is very quickly. Um, but I like the computer side as an owner. You have to remember though, that you're probably, you're not going to have access to that. So it, it can end up costing you more if you're trying to troubleshoot it yourself. Okay. Excellent video, bud. I learned a few things from you over the years. I thank you, Adam. Uh, does your shop hire apprentices? Uh, grand wizard calls in. Are you in a wizard apprentice? Uh, CJ says, have a safe and happy Labor Day. Thank you, CJ. Um, does your shop hire apprentices? Yes. That's pretty much all they can hire now because it's hard to find experienced guys. That's why they uh, Western States just ra raised their wage cap and their base wage is way up. So their minimum wages right now are $25 an hour. That is for a completely green apprentice. So you show up, you have no experience, $25 an hour um, as a mechanic. So, yes. So in the truck shop, there are four of us. Um, there's, I'm not going to say names, but there's my supervisor. He's actually salary. So his time doesn't get billed. Um, but he's very experienced, especially on chassis stuff. Kingpins, anything with paint suspension, he knows everything. Um, and then there's me, who knows next to nothing, of course. Um, and then the other two guys are apprentices. They're somewhat experienced they both worked at uh truck jobs before one worked for a paving company locally and another guy he worked i think at loves and a kenworth dealer but not a lot of years of experience and not really much cat experience but they both got hired on as apprentices on the equipment side it's a lot of um not very experienced guys too younger guys um there are some experienced guys but it's a large percentage, at least at our facility, of just apprentices. But there's tiers of apprentice, too. They, you know, first year, second year, whatever. Um, so, yeah, they do hire apprentices. Why is it hard to find experienced mechanics? Because um, we're valuable, and it's, I think there's a deficit. There's no deficit of equipment, but there's deficits of people that are apt to work on them and are good at it. And mechanics you know, they kind of age fast. There's not a lot of 80 year old mechanics. Um, so it's hard. Yeah. Oh, Larry Brett says 25 entry. Yeah. That's the minimum. And then it goes, you get review every six months. So you can go up, up, up. Um, you know, within a year, you could be at 27. Uh, let's see here. You know, a little more than nothing. Don't sell yourself short. I, I know. Are you guys union? No, we are not. Larry. Hey, Larry. What is your operate for RV diesel repair and troubleshooting? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I hope you're sitting down, Larry. We just raised our RV rates. They are now $200 an hour. Um, so they're quite expensive. I know some places are more than that. I think the Freightliner in Vegas, this was like two years ago. Was it was like $212 an hour. That was two years ago. I don't know what it is now, like $10 billion an hour or something. It's insane. I don't really understand the shop rate difference either on RVs. I'm sure it's because some RV owners are not always the most pleasant to get along with, not including you there. But um, yeah, our I think our truck rate's 160 and our RV rate is 200. So it's, it's significantly more. Want some pizza? I love pizza. That's my favorite. Uh, my first job was at a pizza place. Um, oh my gosh, it's almost been an hour. I don't want to end the stream. I actually am enjoying this. Uh, hi, Josh. Did you find anything out on my CT660 from Sean? Your CT660. 
You're going to have to email me, Sean. I get a lot and a lot of emails a day. I don't specifically remember what you asked me on there. Um, I'm almost always behind on my emails. I, I answer emails for free at depthdate.yahoo.com. Uh, if you want to talk to me on the phone, I do charge for that. But emails are free, guys. Um, of course, you can send a PayPal donation, depthdate.yahoo.com. And then I will probably answer your email quicker, but I will answer them for free either way. I uh, can't understand half of what you do, but appreciate the skill more because of it. Thank you, Matthew. Mr. Smarty Pants says, Mr. Ape, do you watch any other mechanic channels like Bus Grease Monkey does a lot of Detroit diesels? Uh, no, um, I don't watch a ton of YouTube in general. Um, I have many children and I work the YouTube job and my full-time job. And I try to lift weights sometimes. And then I'm also answering emails. Um, so not a lot of downtime. If I do have downtime, like the kids aren't here right now, I'm doing a live stream. And if I wasn't doing a live stream, I'd be editing a video. So um, I don't I don't really follow any other channels. Um, I've watched a few Stephen Cox's videos, um, which I think his, he has a new channel now, something didn't go so well, I think. But um, and then D Boss, I've watched a few of his videos. That C12 one with the hot rod is pretty awesome. Um, I really enjoyed that one. Uh, and also he's had me in a few of his videos, so he's he's a pretty cool guy. Are you having trouble getting cat parts? Got a long block, two months wait time. Uh, John asked, us. "Yes, yeah, uh, cat. But well, it's not just cat. Obviously, coming. Everyone's having part problems. We were doing a rebuild. I could not get um." An oil cooler for it. We got the platinum kit. Didn't get the oil cooler until a month after the job was done. Uh, we had a customer where he was getting a, I think it was a 5EK complete engine. He had to wait like four or five months from Cat. It's really bad. Have you watched Jay Pater? Yes, I'm actually in one of his videos. I watched a few of him. Uh, he's also an Idaho resident, but the state is humongous. He doesn't live right next to me. Uh, please give a random shout out to Omar. Hello, Omar Amaya. I don't know who that is, but hello. Thanks for all the content. Keeps me entertained during downtime. Thank you, Jerome. Uh, MXSC15 spits and sputters when cold. That'd be a good e email question. Have you seen Western Weston Champlin? He put a Cummins. Yeah, he's got more of the... Uh, how do you say this? Uh, bombastic type content you know where it's like oh i'm gonna you know put a jet engine on a dirt bike or something like that um uh, very interesting he has a lot more subscribers than me so maybe i should start doing crazy stuff but i i like what i do what video are you in on the jay pater channel i believe his c15 one hey where he did a c15 uh i did some of the mess with brake saber it's probably about three or four years ago now uh if you do a tune is it bad to if you do a tune, is it bad to delete? Is it bad to delete IVA sensor? So I work for a cat dealer. Um, a lot of people delete their, either the regen asserts or even non-regen asserts with the IVAs or the VVAs. They delete them or they don't delete them. They just back them off and um, away they go. The IVAs are problem prone, not as much as the ARD heads are, but... As a cat dealer, it's a pain when someone brings in a deleted truck or a hot rotted truck because cat is extremely watchful of this stuff. Now, if, if you're working on it and, you know, cat doesn't really care if you work on the engine. The problem comes after you work on it because basically if you have a deleted or hot rotted engine and then there's a warranty failure, cat will basically deny it outright even if it's unrelated. So let's say I do a water pump on a truck that someone has all the same injector trim file numbers in. Three months later, the weep hole, it starts pouring cooling out. Okay, well, I got a one-year parts warranty. Bring it back in the shop, submit it to CAT, they'll deny it right away because they require a warranty download. And if all the injector trim files are the same, they will catch that right away. That's the problem when you start messing with the emissions. Not only is it uh, technically illegal to mess with the emission system, but... Um, it's your truck, though. You know, I'm not telling you what to do with your truck. I'm just letting you know from the dealer standpoint. If 
you were ever to take it to a cat dealer. And a lot of dealers will not touch them. Um, a lot of Peterbilts and cat dealers, if you go in, they'll just say leave. So just remember that if you're down the road and you need it worked on, you might have difficulty getting it worked on. Okay. You put a 346 and a Volkswagen for these. <laughs> you got to put a 346. The engine would weigh more than the car. So that'd be interesting. Uh, Mark says, oh, hello, Mark. He says, hi. Cat failed big time on the regen engine. Uh, yes. Uh, they changed too much stuff all at once. And the RT, the RD head was, I think, a good idea that was very poorly rolled out. And they just changed too much from the 04 engine. And it was bad timing, too, because if you remember, that was 07, 08 was right when the economy crashed, too. And trucking companies were going vertical and you end up with no more cat truck engines. How do you choose hours for quotes? Do you flat rate them or just guess how long it will take? Um, well, I mean, you can look at previous jobs like rebuilds, you, you can kind of get a time frame. You don't know what's going to go wrong, but um, generally it's my supervisor and I will kind of brainstorm. And if you've done a Huey pump in an RV, I've probably done 30 of them. Like you kind of know how long it should take. Of course it might end up taking longer or maybe everything will go great, but you give it a, you give it an accurate, you know, you're not trying to damage the customer, but you're not trying to cut yourself short either. So give it an accurate time of roughly what it should take you. And that's kind of how we do quotes. Our cat dealer won't work on trucks period. That is sad, but yes, some cat dealers do not anymore. Uh, do you prefer to work on cat engines or cat machines? Engines, definitely. I don't like equipment generally. Um, I think it's cool. I don't want to do hydraulics or pins or tracks or is I would rather work on the engine all the time. We are now two minutes over. I'm still having, I'm enjoying this. So if do you want me to keep on going? I don't mind going a little bit, although I'm going to get some premium cream soda here. Uh, let's see here. You want me to keep doing? Can you do a video? Yeah, keep going. Okay. Tessa, I'll go to seven. How about that? That's an hour and a half. I can't believe it's already been an hour, though. See, I can just keep talking. Thanks for all the information. Great help on C9. Okay, cool. Thank you, Keith. I remember your uh, I remember your name, Keith Purvis. I believe you've emailed me, perhaps. Larry, after watching your videos, my mechanic took an hour to remove the Huey pump and 30 minutes to put it back in. Wow, that's a really good time. In an RV, that's a really good time. I once had a truck right when I started at the Western States dealer, and it had a C7 in it. It was a truck, obviously. Um, and I timed myself and I had the Huey pump off and on in 15 minutes. That was pretty cool. Um, but it there, it's two bolts and a couple lines. And I've done, I don't know how many, I've done a lot of C7 Huey pumps. Okay, what's the difference between a warranty report and a product status report? So product status report is more of an equipment thing in my experience. Um, and this is kind of an in the weeds cat question. So generally when you hook up to an engine, a cat engine, it will ask you if you want to do a warranty download. If you do a warranty repair, but you don't do have a warranty download, it's denied automatically. So you have to do a warranty download. It gets sent to cat. There's also something called a product status report, which is something you have to go in and create. And it get it can get more information. Um, and it also asking trim files are found on a PSR product status report. I don't know. I mostly deal with warranty reports because um, that's on the truck side. We don't really do product status reports that often unless I'm going to try and order new emissions stickers. If I'm ordering new emissions stickers, I'll usually pull a product status report because cat my ass for it. Richard Guzman, uh, Robert Guzman, sorry. My 07C15 and a cold start check engine light comes in and out and in makes pop. Can you hear the exhaust until it just warms up at the end? It's, so it's popping it cold. Um, that, that That's a difficult question to answer in a chat or like a live stream. But uh, probably you've got a misfiring injector when it's cold would be my guess. Or I don't know if you're getting a check engine light. You should get it hooked up with ET. Definitely see if you're getting a check engine light. It might not even be showing on the dash. Maybe you're getting like a current low or current high fault for one of the injectors. Um, get someone with ET to hook up to it. Test your fuel pressure. Always check your fuel pressure. Um, and then, but you may have an injector that's misfiring when cold. That's my guess. 
Grow back the beard. I think I will for this winter because um, I'm going to try and ride my bike through the winter. Not sure that's going to work, but we'll see. How often does an engine need to overhead ran? Well, that's... Cat has guidelines for how often you should run the overhead. Generally, I say if it's a rebuild or a new engine, probably the first or second oil change, probably the second oil change, it's a good idea to rerun it because, of course, the most wear is going to happen when an engine is new. After that, probably every 100,000 miles, of course, whatever the hours correlate to that, um, really snow. Um, you must be talking about the bike riding. Yes. Uh, I got like these thing called bar mitts that go on the bars and then, uh, it's a fat tire bike. So the tires are huge. So I don't know. We'll see. I, people didn't have cars hundred years ago, so I'm, we'll see if I can get there. Um, can you do a video or series about electrical diagnostics? Electric diagnostics specifically. So I'm actually going to be making an electrical class, kind of like the engine 101 class that's in the plans. I actually made one, but I didn't like how the audio turned out. And I spent like an hour recording it and then I started editing it and then I just deleted it. Um, so I'm going to make one better quality. I actually have all my electrical stuff right here. Um, like I even got like a little battery and... I've got my multimeter and stuff. Um, and I'm going to go through kind of the basics, like we're electrons and then go up to like circuits, parallel series circuit. Um, I've had a lot of electrical classes and I do a lot of electrical. So I'm, I think I'm knowledgeable on it, but if you've never had a class, it's electrical is the one thing where the class is more important than in, in person. Whereas like most mechanical stuff, I think you'd learn more in person, but electrical, since you can't see it moving, you need the foundation of the class more than you do just real world like troubleshooting. It's the class is very important. Let's see here. Hey, Josh, I'm an early starter in the industry and want to eventually move to being a cat equipment technician and good training, any good training available. Um, I don't know. I mean, if you best thing to do would be get with a dealer like Western States has a training program. You will get lots of training. We have a training department. Um, try to get with a dealer. If you're working for like a an independent company, you're probably not going to get hardly any training in my experience. So if you want to get trained up, try to get on with a dealer. I think that would be your best bet. Uh, you have a lot of kids. Are you Mormon? Uh, and I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to have a religious discussion, but I am not. So. Is Cat designing new engines? Yes, not for trucks, of course. They're always working on their engines. They have electricity is the movement of electrons between atoms. That is correct. Class over then, right? If you already know the answer. Dr. 15 PSI is low. Not sure what you're talking about there. Hello, I'm from Iowa. I used to run a C15 and a Western Star with, a C with an 18 speed. Really enjoy watching your channel. Oh, well, thank you, Ronald. Uh going to ride that bike in the winter you're going to need a snowmobile suit and a really good helmet i have an insulated helmet and i've got the goggles we're we're rocking they actually make studded tires for it so we'll see well cat go electric well they already have batteries in them um i believe they made a d7 electric but i heard it was horrible i i don't know i don't think the battery technology is there to for equipment to go electric i mean it also the problem is how do you charge it usually equipment is where there's no charging like it's not you know you can't park a d9 and just plug it into your wall at your house it's i don't know maybe there will be a time but it it would be down the road i believe is 3306 b have enough power for a dump truck in your opinion yeah they used to put them uh in dump trucks 3306s so it's like the little brother of the 3406 depends how big of a dump truck if you're running a very large dump truck like a double axe or whatever 3306 not going to make a ton of power. So just remember that. Um, let's see. Do you have all medium duty ASC certs? I don't have any ASC certifications. I'm cat doesn't really care. At least the cat, the two cat dealers I've worked at don't care about ASC certifications. That's kind of an independent thing. And in my experience, more of an automotive side thing. But I, I could be wrong about that, but I'm like the highest tier tech master tech at a cat dealer i don't have any ascs so there you go 
What other applications CF C15 used in? Oh, uh, everything. Marine, generators, um, and sometimes they don't call them C15s. There's like generators that look on like a 3456, which is actually a C16 technically, but uh, they're in equipment, generators, marine applications, uh, drilling, like industrial engines. They were in trucks. Um, don't think they're in aviation, but uh, they're cat use them in everything. They're everywhere. D6 is better than the D7 electric, more simple. Okay. ASC is for pencil pushers. Maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, it would be pretty difficult to use an electric motor to generate electricity. Yes. I. If you tried to use an electric motor to generate electricity, you would just be losing energy in the thing because you, you can't end up with more energy. Like, what? Yeah, that just doesn't work. Can you describe AD63 engine? I've never heard of one of those. Josh Cummins is the same way with ASCs. They don't care. Yeah, I don't think most, like Detroit, I don't I don't know if they really care about that type of stuff. It seems like cars win ASC, but trucks, like if you are if you can work on Detroit's, you work on Detroit's. Like they don't care. Hello, Umberto. What's your favorite engine that Cat produces or has been made? My favorite was definitely a C15 on assert. Uh, least favorite was a C7. Do they seem to put trucks for way too big? Yeah, they had some really big. We used to have crane trucks with C7s in them, some double axle dump trucks. Um, I like the C7 to work on at least. They're so simple. You can run an overhead in like 15 minutes. Uh, you don't have to do anything to pull the injectors other than pull the valve cover off. Uh, you can change a Huey pump very quickly. They don't have to be timed. Um, they don't have liners. It's not great. My favorite cat engine, C13, KCB C13, for a variety of reasons. One, you don't have to cut counter bores. First engine I, the first cat engine I ever built by myself was a C13 in a tour bus, a Van Hole tour bus. Uh, so that's why the C13, like the valve cover gasket is like that. Th okay, it's not that thick, but it's thick. And there's like 10 or 12 valve cover bolts. Same with the oil pan. There's like 12 oil pan bolts and the gasket's super thick. Um, so you don't have to worry about you can measure liner height, but it's not correctable. So there's not, it's not the same problem the C15 has. I'm not saying it's the best engine ever made. It's, I'm saying it's my favorite. Like a 6NZ C15 would be better in a truck just due to it. It's going to run longer. The cam's going to last longer. It's going to give the truck more power, more. Um, it's going to make the truck more valuable. But my favorite engine is a C13. Yeah. What do we got? Common shops pay isn't worth the trouble and travel for training. Okay. Boss, um, KCB. Hey, Brett likes KCBs. Good. See? Genius is on here. I will never want to mess with the 3600s. We get them at our shop and just say no. 3600. I've only seen one of those, and that was in I had a, a training class at the CAT headquarters in Peoria, Illinois once. This was a while ago. This was like 2007 maybe. And that place is, I'm sure some people have been there, but it's amazing. And they had a dissected 3600 series engine with like the head cut in half. And if you don't know what the, so if you've ever seen a 3400 series, which is a C15, the next size up is a 3500, which is humongous, 3000 horsepower. The next size up after that, which I believe is the biggest engine cat made was a 3600 series. Um, those were mostly in trains and very heavy duty um, applications. I've heard they're not that good of an engine, but I never worked on them. I've only seen one of them. So, have you ever, uh, Mark S., have you ever worked on a racing engine? Uh, well, not really racing. I, so, I had a old Ford pickup truck that was a long bed and I made it a short bed and it had a 352 Ford in it. And a guy at work said, You should put a 460 in it. I was like, Sounds good. So, I put a 460 in it and I put like beer cam and stuff. And I mean, it was a pretty heavy truck and it had a, a four speed transmission. It was, it would run like high 14 second quarter miles, which is not that fast, you know, compared to like a Tesla or, you know, an actual fast car. But for that heavy truck with the, you know, uh, drum brakes and stuff, it was, it was fun and it was a stick shift. So uh, not really a racing engine, but that was, yeah, that's what it was. Uh, what do you think about the C7 assert? So our, 
This is Tim Martinez. C7 assert. So all C7s are assert engines. 04 is when the C7 came out. It's an assert. However, it has no emissions controls on it. Um, you're probably referring to, if you say a C7 assert, you're referring to a C7S. So that's a C7S serial number. The That's a regen C7. The pre-regen C7s were KAL, SAP, and WAX serial number prefixes. I like those. The C7S, however, which is the one I just did a couple of videos on, is probably the worst truck engine cat ever made, in my opinion. Um, it doesn't have liners, has lots of injector problems, lots of fuel system problems, regen problems, like the ARD heads are always failing. Um, the injectors will work fine and they'll get a not responding properly code and the correct fix is to replace the injectors, even though they're not misfiring. Um, they're not good engines and they're very finicky. Um, yeah, not a fan. Let's see. Uh, that was Tim. I already answered that question. C7 or C12 oil pressure is 15 hot um, at idle. Is that too low? In, technically, no. This is Dr. Steiger. So C10 and C12 oil pressure, the specification is super, super, super low. Um, I believe it's 2 PSI is the minimum specification for oil pressure at idle. I'd have to... If it if you're having problems with that, just email me. But um, it's like it's like it's like two psi. The oil pressure on C10 and C12 is super low. Um, it has something to do with it as an external oil pump, and it uses remote sensing for the pressure regulator valve, I believe. But they run very low oil pressure in general. Um, so that's probably above spec. What you need to look for though is if you're Let's say it used to idle at 30 PSI and now it's at 15, like it dropped over a week or it dropped overnight. That is something to be concerned of. You, If that happened, I would recommend cutting your oil filter open, looking for metal. Also get an oil analysis done. Um, you can do them yourself. They're like eight, they're $18 at Western States. They're like $20 at a lot of dealerships. You just pull an oil sample, send it in. They'll tell you if it has elevated copper, iron, bearing materials, whatever. 2 PSI, yes. Holy cow. Yeah, Turbo says that. But yeah, um, it's very low. Um, it's surprisingly low when you look up the specifications. Uh, I got to say it. Uh, Cummins does medium duty engines better than CAT. Heavy duty is a different story. Uh, I guess. I mean, they they went over the market. Um, five nines are very popular. Um, I wouldn't mind owning a five nine Cummins. I don't own a diesel engine though, but um they they make a good engine i like the c7 though um i like this i like 3126 is better but yeah i i don't know or for cummins can we be friends <laughs> yeah no problem i don't i don't hate cummins i mean i pretend to hate cummins sometimes but they're just another diesel engine manufacturer um that just happens to be a competitor and they use an ugly red color but you know whatever um I'm for sure going to check that specification on SIS tomorrow. I should check it right now, but it's it's very low. Um, look it up. The C13 is low also, but it's not as low as the 15. Uh, let's see here. Bought a rebuilt C15. Didn't check the paperwork because I'm newbie. Oil still looks new after 6K, but there's blow-by. Is blow-by normal? Yes. So depending on what kind of C15 too, the assert ones, so the, the compound, the two turbo ones, the compound turbo ones, they always had fairly high blow by but i already kind of discussed blow by get if you think the blow by is high get them to do a volume measurement on it cubic feet per hour and compare that to your horsepower it should be less than twice the horsepower so if yours is 500 horsepower it should be less than a thousand um we can paint it any color you like yeah no my my boss is an old cummins guy and he's he's always like oh, i'm gonna get you to bleed red and i was like well i i do bleed red but that doesn't mean i like cummins so why don't you like heavy equipment? I think it's cool. I don't like working on it. Um, I mean, if you see like where the oil pan is in a D8 or something, it's just a pain. Like getting up onto the equipment. I did that C18 in the haul truck. Like the engine's great, but like it's just, it's a pain to work on. Like a truck is 
easier slow to the ground like there's no there's not 50 pumps running off the back of the engine and the worst thing you can have is a pto on a truck so okay there's your c15 is it a c15 or c-15 uh that's true so yeah if it's a c there's a difference if you ever know look at a c15 c15 means it's an assert engine if it's a c-15 that means it's a non-read or a non-assert engine so it's a single turbo um does john goldsmith have a channel uh i don't think he does i don't know how much he knows about video editing he he look at that uh hey josh tomorrow i start my 43rd year i'm assuming he means of wrenching which means he's been wrenching much longer than i've been alive he and i email him sometimes especially on mechanical engines you know like 3306s and 3406s. He know he's probably forgotten more stuff than I know about a 3406B. Um, he does not have a channel. It'd be a good channel, John. Just saying, you know, just spend all your free time doing videos. Um, I don't like working on trucks there. Yeah, the so the equipment guys are always coming up to me. They're like, oh, that piece of crap truck, or like, oh, not another RV. I actually like working on RVs. Um, they're not that bad, really. Um, you just have to realize, like, okay. What is it? Like, is it a rear radiator and you're doing the serpentine belt? It's going to suck. Are you doing an overhead? Might not be that bad. You're going to lay down and adjust the valves. Um, it's just, you know, someone owns the engine. Someone's got to take care of it. Don't. Someone's got to work on it. I like trucks, RVs, whatever. What do you think about Detroit 60, 12.7? I've heard good things about them. I've only done like oil changes on them. Um, yeah. Uh, I work at Mustang Cat. I'm a field tech. It's not as bad as what you think. So I used to be a field mechanic on the generator side in Vegas. And uh, it's not, it wasn't for me. I like being in the shop. I like having all my tools and other guys there. Some guys hate being in the shop. They want to be out in the field. That's more of a, that's more of a personal preference. But I, I prefer to be in the shop. It's just how I'm wired. It, it's not a right or wrong thing. Uh, uh, what's a good way to contact John Goldsmith? So he, I, yeah, he's on, he's always in the comments section. Um, yeah. So if you ask questions, he's very nice. Like he'll come in and answer very weird questions for people sometimes. Um, so the best way is probably just go in the email sections. I doubt he wants people emailing on a personal email, but maybe he does. I don't know. If he did, he'd probably tell you in the uh, comment section when he replies. Uh, Moa says, what's up, Adept? Hello. How much is an oil change cost nowadays? 1K, 1,000. I don't... An RV service is probably close to $1,000 because we usually charge... Dependent if it's a big RV, we'll charge about three hours labor. But our services don't go like, oh my God, three hours. Like our services are like 60 items that we check. So we like check your kingpins. We grease the chassis. We change the fuel filters. We check the batteries. We check your air pressure. We check the brakes. We check the differential level and the transmission. We check the freeze point of the coolant. We check the lights. Uh, there's like a bunch of stuff. So that's, you're talking $600 labor there for an RV. Then the oil is, you know, it might hold 10 gallons if it's a large RV or maybe six gallons of oil. Diesel oil is expensive. Then you got your filters, grease, it's, and then taxes and stuff. It's, it's probably eight to a thousand dollars depending. And sometimes they add stuff, you know? So yeah. Okay. Have you heard of duct injectors? New, no, but I don't know. Maybe I should look up duct injectors. Uh, live. Yes, it's live. I love your videos on how you do them. Keep it up. Yeah, I was working on a video today. It should be really good. So that's the serpentine belt conversion. Oh, man, we're almost at seven now. C18 Gen Set, one side manifold, glow red. Any advice? Already changed the injector and turbo, yet it's glow on 70% load. So I'm a, well, C18 is a single log manifold. So I'm assuming like the front or the rear is glowing red. Um, something's going on there. It's not getting fuel. Um, you need to hook up with Caddy T most likely and see 
if you can get it to stop glowing red by cutting out cylinders and then find out which cylinder is causing the problem, then you can dig into that cylinder and see, okay, maybe we have a valve problem, valve train problem, cylinder pressure problem, injector problem. That would be my suggestion. Uh, the type of oil brand matter on a fresh rebuild. Not to me. Some guys get in the weeds on, oh, it's got to be Shell or Rotella or whatever. I don't really think, in my opinion, there's a big difference on oil brands. Um, I know a lot of places, oil comes out of the same warehouse. They just put slightly different additives and then different packaging. Um, there are standards for oil quality. And if the oil meets that quality, I don't see a reason not to use it. There are very high premium oils. Are they better? Probably. Um, I'm more of an advocate for synthetic versus non-synthetic. I like synthetic oils. Um, but I've torn down million mile engines where guys ran non-synthetic oil and sometimes the bearings look new with a million miles on them, you know, and they didn't do any sort of weird maintenance plan and put magnets and all sorts of weird stuff. Like um, just getting oil changes more frequently is probably more important than going with X brand of oil, in my opinion. Uh, it says, howdy, was at a GM dealership for 13 years, hated that work for a railroad last 10 years as a field mechanic. Love it, except when I have to call Cat out because we don't have the computers. Yeah, that's what well, we were discussing, the open source stuff. And you guys, know, if everyone could access that stuff, but that sounds cool. I think railroads in another life, I think working on a railroad would have been really cool. Uh, I like your videos. Keep it up, uh, Brandon Croft. Thank you. Any 6140 lugger experience i've never heard i don't even know what that is is that an engine quality brand oil and cat filters well definitely the cat filters i mean yes um there is a i'm sure there is a difference in quality as far as a premium oil brand to like the cheapest super tech oil but um if it's within the the sae guidelines or whatever i think you're okay we see cat engines again in a semi i don't think so not ever again um, I mean, the closest thing was when they were doing the glider kits, but I believe that's pretty much all been closed down. How much do you know about 1693 cats? Already discussed that. Uh, basically nothing. What communication adapter do you use? The Comet after two or no, three, two. That's old school. Comet after three. Uh, 3512 in that loco. Uh, 3512. I I thought they used 3600 in locomotives i could be wrong i've seen a c175 that one at the old dealership those are pretty cool the new like big engines pin around baldwin filters i i don't like them very much i really like cat filters uh, i think they are better uh, the fleet guards are kind of weird like the way they use the stacked pleats but they're pretty good quality like the media it's uh got the spiral roving um in the the beating like they're good filters good quality filter why did they clip shut down glider kits uh, and emissions from what i understand because they're putting old engines in new trucks can't have that thoughts on afina filters i don't think i've ever heard of those uh what combination adapter do you use for non-cat stuff we use a nexic nexic 2 i believe um for like uh cummins and stuff what do you know about Cat's new content engines? Are you talking about the truck engines that are new content? Um, I, I know they make like new blocks and you can basically get a new truck engine with new parts. I think the problem is getting the engine itself because you can barely get large cat parts. It's a real pain in the butt. Uh, cat ELC coolant. Yes, you should use ELC, uh, especially in C15s. They have real problems with cavitation especially around the liner O-rings. Don't run cheap coolant um, and then change it out every couple years. It it can save the liner seal area of your cylinders. And because last thing you want to do is pull the liners out and it's all cavitated away where the liner seals go. That's such a pain in the butt. Can you cut out cylinder while it's... Seven? Yes, you can cut out a cylinder at any load. Um, really? to see it's not going to hurt it. It will increase the load on the other injectors. You have to remember that if you cut out one cylinder. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, parts get for a cat. Baldwin, LOO. Good in a pinch, that's all. I'm a uh, 
Part Part Sky for Cat One Wisconsin. Your videos have really helped me with my job. Oh, cool. Blade. Wanna what's the cat filter for a cat C15 MBN? Uh, if you're talking about the oil filter, it should be a one or eighteen oh eight. Pretty much all the all the C15s use that, even the C9s, C13s, C11s. Is there a way to measure air fuel ratio, like with an oxygen sensor? Well, diesels don't really care about air fuel ratio because they're generally running lean at all times. Unlike a gas where it restricts airflow, diesels do not restrict airflow. What brand tool truck tools do you mainly buy? I mostly have Snap on, but I've got a variety. A lot of SunX impacts. Cat, the cat sockets are Snap on made. Uh, Snap on used to make the wrenches. I've got mostly Snap on wrenches. Sockets are mostly Snap on or cat. I've got some Cornwall stud installers, removers. Most of my ratchets are Matco and Snap on. Got a lot of tools. Um, got a fluke multimeter. My all my all my electric stuff's pretty much Milwaukee. I really like Milwaukee. What? But I do not buy their batteries. Really, I buy the like Power Extra Amazon ones. I've had pretty good luck with those, and they're like a quarter of the price. So, uh, how soon for an overhead after rebuild? I answered that already. Generally, like your second oil change. Uh, what are your thoughts on Cummins and Detroit? How does Cat compare to these motors? I don't, I'm not real familiar with either of them. Um, they're both, they're all good engines. They make good and bad engines. So, all right, I'm going to answer three more questions. I actually have all my fingers, but we're going to do three more questions on it because I haven't eaten dinner yet. So, okay. So I'm a freshman in high school. Wow. I used to be a freshman in high school and I'm wanting to become a heavy duty diesel mechanic. This is back road boys TV. Okay. So that you didn't ask a specific question there, but uh, so you want to be a mechanic. Best way to do it is get a job. Try to, there's a deficit of technicians or mechanics. I usually call myself a mechanic, not a technician, but whatever. Um, best thing to do is try to get on as an apprentice somewhere. Or even if you can't get on as an apprentice, get a job with an equipment company. My first job with CAT, I was not a mechanic. I was a yard attendant for delivering generators and running cable, not a mechanic. And so what did I do? I delivered generators, light towers, and ran cable and did like basic maintenance stuff. Um, and I was going to automotive school at the time, but that didn't really get me the job and it didn't pay very well. But guess what? I got my foot in the door at CAT. And within a year, I was an apprentice mechanic. And then here we are now. So that's the best way. Try to get a job. You can go spend a bunch of money on tools, but or not on tools. You have to buy tools on schooling. Generally, I would say try to get a job though. Where are the dogs? I don't know if you can hear them. They're behind this wall. Uh, is there a think? Is the think big program still? Yes. So Western States, I don't know if this company I work for, um, they have their own technician program also. Uh, I think they're doing it in Meridian and they have one in the North too. It's Spokane, but they're, they're, training their own technicians, and then you get the job with Western States, assuming you're on horrible. Um, but yes, the Think Big program, we have two apprentices. One just came out of the Western States program. One was in the Think Big program. Think Big program, I believe, is longer than the Western States program. But contact your local uh, cat dealer. Most of them have like a hiring manager or their HR department or their training team and ask them about it. They are almost always hiring. Find out what programs they offer for training. Okay. Last question. Uh, thanks for the live stream. You are welcome. Need more live stream? Thanks, Josh. Well, this is pretty fun. I don't uh, got the milk and cookies. Yes, you said you would. You were supposed to share them, though, Jamie. What the heck? I don't see any. I just have my soda here. It's diet. Don't worry. Although some people think that's worse. Do you prefer? Uh, okay, I won't count this as a question. Uh, do you prefer? Nipex, or I believe it's actually pronounced Knipex over tool truck tools. Yes, uh, tool Nipex pliers are rebadged for many of the tool trucks. They are excellent, excellent, but very expensive. Um, yeah, I've got a lot of Nipex. I've got their like, what are they called? Pliers wrenches, which is like their, their crescent wrench. Those are excellent. I've got the parrot wrenches, flush cuts, their piano wire cutters. They're amazing quality tools. If you don't, if you don't have any Nipex, once you buy them, you're screwed. Cause then you have to start buying. 
Uh, okay, so this will be the last question. Uh, awesome session. Hey, thank you. Am I your number one fan, Brandon Warren? I don't know. Are you? Nip X or die. Thank you. Really enjoy the channel. Thank you. Can you uh, explain about the boost pressure sensor? What is the normal reading in ET? Um, uh, okay, that's kind of a, an odd question. So can you explain about the boost pressure sensor? What is the normal reading in ET? So Omar asked that. So this will be the last question. Um, can you explain the boost pressure sensor? So what is the boost pressure sensor? Well, your diesel engine, if it has a turbocharger, creates boost, which is compressed air in the intake manifold into the cylinders to get more air into the cylinders. Boost pressure sensor is just reading the PSI or KPA of the boost. Um, and you ask, what is the normal reading in a T? So that's like saying, you know, what's, what's the normal fuel pressure? What engine? What model of that engine? So if, if you ask me, what is the normal fuel pressure in a C7? I'm going to ask you, is it a Huey C7 or a common rail C7? Because those are different. Um, so you're asking, what is the normal reading of the boost pressure sensor in ET? It depends on the engine. So if you're talking about a C15, if it's a single, um, the super chats. I don't know how that works. I'll have to research that for next time. But anyway, um, the next, so the boost pressure matters on the model. If it's a single turbo 6NZ C15, the boost, and it depends on horsepower too. I always look it up. There's something Cat has called TMI. It's not too much information. It's technical marketing information. You can see what the dynode numbers are for an engine that Cat built. Let's say we have a C15 that comes in, single turbo, and it's got low boost. I always look up what the specification was when the engine was new. And then that's my benchmark for how much it has. It might have 30 PSI or 35 PSI. The compound turbos like the asserts would have a lot more than that. I've seen them be at 50 PSI of boost. So whatever your engine is, you have to find out what the specification is before saying what is the correct number. You don't know if you got to know what your engine serial number is, find out what the specification is, then you can read it. That is how you tell what the boost is. Okay. I think that'll do it. I got to go eat dinner. I've been up since 3 a.m. because I'm a weirdo and I can't sleep anymore. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoy the video that's coming out this weekend. Um, I'm going to try and get it done, although it's going to be in a short weekend. But uh, it's going to be, I might break it up into two videos. It's going to be that C16 with the serpentine belt retrofit. It's This is one of the coolest projects I've worked on. Um, uh, glad the customer brought it up. He actually brought it up from Texas for me to work on it. So thank you very much. But uh, thank you for everyone. Um, I know most of these names have seen you in the comments section before in the videos. And I always read the comments, even the mean, nasty ones, although I usually delete those. But um, thank you guys so much for joining and watching. And I hope you enjoyed the live stream. And uh, thanks for watching the channel. You're the reason I have the channel. So thank you very much. All right. Good night.